new, a, a new um, series starting today, His Name. We're going to be parked in Isaiah 9, 6 for this month. Isn't that exciting? And we're going to take a look at some of the, we're going to like, we're going to take a look at these at these four names: Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. See, they aren't just adjectives; they're His names. They're who He is. Isn't that exciting stuff? And as we look at this, you know, the whole reason for stopping for the month of December and focusing in on who He is is because he is the only hope that we have. He is the light of the world. There is none other. It's all about Jesus. So let's just stop and reflect on him. And then, you know what? What a great opportunity this month affords us to, to really be out there talking about him. There's people singing. about. You go to the mall and you hear the name of Jesus Christ on the radio and on the speakers. I play Christmas music on my bus. I can't, I can't play the light radio during the week, but I can play 92.9, and they, you know what comes on every once in a while? God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay, for Christ your sit Lord and Savior was born on Christmas Day. Good stuff. Preaching the gospel. I like that song. Glory to God. Whew. So as we look at today... Um, a few things to notice. First, we're talking about names. And you know that names are powerful. Names, names, especially back in biblical times, were really more than just something we called somebody. They were, they were part of their identity. So it's really important. If you're, if you're a young parent and you're looking at naming your kids, be very careful. Here's a few people that their parents should have been a little more careful. I actually know a man or knew a man back in the day his last name was Moore. His parents named him Les. So his name is Les Moore. I'm like, well, that's a walking conundrum or walking oxymoron. It's like, Les Moore, or is it more, more Les or Les Moore? And then how about the woman named Lois? Her last name was Price. So she went around, everybody said, hey, Lois Price. That's good stuff, huh? And then there was Anita. Anita would have been fine, but her last name was Man. So if you say it real fast, I need a man. It's like, oh my goodness, we've got to be careful with these names. One more. A woman named Helen. She was doing fine until she got married. And she married a guy named Back. So her name is now Helen Back. I hope that's not what her marriage was like, but it's like, Wow. So anyhow, names are important, and names really did do signify a lot more than, I think, even in our time. I mean, my name is Michael. You know what Michael means in Hebrew? One who is like God. And I'm not like him, but I want to become more and more like him. Amen? So what does your name mean? Have you ever discovered that? Have you ever looked into it? It's one of those fun things. I, I, I try to do that when we do baby dedications and look at the names and, and try to figure out what God is, might be saying through your name. And in, in this day and age, our identities are such a important... I mean, identity is a buzzword, isn't it? So everybody's talking about identity, identity, identity. Well, your identity is not wrapped up in your name, but it is wrapped up in your father. Your father names you, and my heavenly father calls me Michael. Because he sees what I will be someday, one who is like him. He sees what I'm being made into. What does your heavenly father call you? What's your name that he's given you? And don't listen to what the world said about you and called you and all of those things all these years. Some of you maybe were called things like useless or stupid or, um, or, or they prophesied negative things over you. They cursed you with words saying you'll never amount to anything. I break that off in the name of Jesus. You are created in the image of likeness of God, and you are being transformed more and more into his likeness every day for his glory. Wonderful counselor is what we're going to talk about today, but before we start, let's just pray. Father, I want to thank you. I want to thank you that, that you 
gave these names to your son Jesus, and you sent him here on a mission. You sent him here to save us. You sent him here to heal us. You sent him here to comfort us. You sent him here to do so many things for us. But God, we were dead, and now we're alive. Thank you, God. And God, I pray that as we look at Wonderful Counselor, that you would help us to to fully embrace that part of who you are. And I pray that we would, we would actually be doers of the word after today, that, that we would actually be changed by what's spoken today, that you would make us doers of your word and healing would come through it. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Wonderful counselor. Let's start with just starting with uh, reading this passage of scripture. For unto us a child is given. The government will be upon his shoulders and he will be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, Prince of Peace. Do you think you can memorize that verse over the next four weeks? Yes. For unto us a child is born. You can memorize it in a different version. I don't care. This is new living. To un- a son is given. And we could, t- we could preach probably a whole series on that first part of it. We're going to focus in on his names, who he is. Wonderful is an interesting word. Now, let me ask you a question. So if you were real quick, you saw the answer up there. Let me ask you a question. If in English, if I were to say Heather is a wonderful person, what, what type of word is wonderful? Is it a verb, an adverb, an adjective, or a noun? Heather is a wonderful person. It's an adjective. It's describing Heather, correct? Well, it's interesting that this word is not an adjective in Hebrew. Did you know that, ma'am? It's a noun. Because it's not saying he is wonderful. I mean, it's not saying that he's a wonderful thing. It's saying the very, his very essence is wonderful. He's wonderful. It's amazing, and it means to be beyond understanding, too wonderful for words. And if you think about even the English word, full of wonder is what you're saying. He is full of wonder. I mean, and the, it's one of those weird things. It seems like the more I get to know him, the more I know that I don't know him. Because every time you turn around, there's this wonderful new facet of him that you didn't recognize before, that you didn't know before. You didn't know him as your healer, perhaps, before he healed you. You didn't know him as your provider. Next thing you know, it's like, whoa, he just blows the lid off from you after you've been walking with him for all these years. And all of a sudden, it's like, wow, there's more. There's always more of him. You'll never, ever get to know him like he knows you until we get to glory. And then it's a promise. We'll know him like he knows us. He's too wonderful for words. That's a noun. Now, the counselor is, is what? If I say wonderful counselor, is that a verb, an adverb, an adjective, or a noun? So it's a noun, counselor. Not in this sentence, it's a verb. So the, the verb is actually describing wonderful. So the, the wonderful actually does the counseling. The wonderful is the counselor. It's like, wow, that's pretty wild. And it means what we know it to mean, to advise, to consult, to guide. Wonderful counselor. A counselor who is so wonderful that it's beyond description. So can you trust him? If those, if those two words are true, can you trust that he's going to be a good counselor? He's not going to give you bad counsel. He's going to give you wonderful counsel full of wonder. And just be thankful that we don't serve a God who doesn't know what we go through. In Hebrews, it tells us, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet is without sin. Isn't that amazing? Think about this. So when's the last time you got tempted? Anybody want to volunteer? This morning? Was it road rage? Oh, skipping church. Well, I'm glad you didn't. Glad you're here. But we all fall into temptation, don't we? Now think about this. Jesus had the same temptations. There were times, so this is what this is saying. There was at least once where Jesus was like, I don't really want to go to synagogue today. But he did because it's the right thing to do because he was being obedient to his father. When's the last time any of you guys looked at a woman like you shouldn't? Nobody wants to volunteer? Come on. Hey, 
Anybody who has, anybody who has any testosterone and red blood is probably looked at, at a woman in a way that they shouldn't look at them. Jesus had the same temptation, yet he never sinned. That's pretty good, huh? Okay, ladies, one's for you. Um, give me one, Heather. Yeah. Overspending. Overshopping. <laughs> Two crockpots. Jesus never went overboard materialistically. But he was tempted the same way we are. Isn't that exciting to know that we have a God who recognizes that life is hard sometimes and, and we have a tendency to be full of fear. And, you know, fear comes out in some ways, doesn't it? It comes out with worry and anxiety and stress. All of those are, are symptoms of fear. And fear is the opposite of faith. Jesus never once felt fear, anxiety, stress. Imagine that. I mean, he knows he's going to the cross and he's got to walk that path, yet he's never worried, never had anxiety, never was stressed out. Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Now, having a wonderful counselor that we don't go to would be kind of foolish, wouldn't it? I mean, he's opened his door. He said, hey, I'm available any time. Come to me. If you're weary and heavy laden, what does he say? Come to me. Come to the altar. Come. Let us reason together. Come. So his door's open and the bill's been paid, so why would we not go to see the counselor? He is the wonderful counselor. So let's just take a look at what he did. He came for the sick. So he's, he's, the, the Pharisees had approached him and were kind of giving him a hard time because he's hanging out with people like Matthew, who was a tax collector, and by association, even if he wasn't guilty himself, he was guilty by association of being a crook and a thief. and He would overtax people and keep parts of the money for himself. So here's Matthew that Jesus is hanging out with. And the Pharisees came and said, hey, you're hanging out with a bunch of sinners. Just imagine if, uh, <laughs> just imagine if some of the people that we look up to in the New Testament were actually pastors of your local church. Just think about that for a little bit. I think that's a pretty interesting thought. So Jesus says to him, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. I've come to call the righteous, not, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. How can you minister to those that are in need if you're never around those that are in need? Now, conversely, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. You go hang out with people, they're going to pull you down, you stay away from them. You go there on a purpose with an intentionality to serve them, to love them into the kingdom, not to just hang out with them. If you want your marriage to be successful, the last thing you should do is go hang out with a, people who, a bunch of people who don't like marriage. I've had a hard time in marriage. Maybe they've been divorced, and they're still bitter and angry and resentful, and all men are bad or all women are bad, and blah, blah, blah. Next thing you know, your marriage is in the pits because of the people you're hanging out with. So hang out with the right people, but... We are on a mission just like he was. He came to save the sick. And guess what? Some of us are sick. Some of us are sick right now. Some of us were sick a little bit ago. Some of us will be sick in the future. And I'm not just talking physically. You know what I mean? I thought I pushed the button. <coughs> Whoa. <clears throat> See, I'm sick. That was very timely, wasn't it? So... Are, where are you sick? And I thought up some words. Maybe, maybe it's fear that plagues you. You can't even get out of your own way sometimes because you're so afraid. Anybody, I mean, anybody honest enough to admit that they deal with fear? Look at all the hands. Fear can be such a debilitating thing. It can cause you to be so stressed out. It can actually affect your physical being. And we're told not to be afraid. We're told that perfect love cast out all fear. We're told don't fear. Yet, we struggle with it. There's a, there's a wound in our very spirit that causes us not to trust him. Fear is a lack of trusting in him. Because he has said he's a good God and he will only give us good gifts. He's with us. How about bitterness? Anybody in here struggle with bitterness? Bitterness can kill you. Bitterness stems from unforgiveness. 
but it gets to a point where it's got a life of its own. And, and you see people and you don't like them. You actually turns into hate and bitterness and you can get all twisted up inside. And, and I've seen people have gotten so bitter that it's actually changed their outward appearance. That's a scary thing. And there's people in the church that struggle with bitterness. There's people in the church that struggle with anger. And most of it doesn't happen on Sunday morning. Right? Because we got our church face on. But what happens on Monday morning when the kids aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing and you need to get in the car and, and arr, next thing you know, you're flipped out, your blood pressure's through the roof, your face is all red, your veins are popping out of your head. Now, I don't get angry very easy. Um, and when I do, I don't get very demonstrative. I used to be very passive-aggressive, which is no better than being aggressive-aggressive. Just made me look better. So maybe your anger comes out in different ways. Maybe, maybe you're the get even type of person instead of the blow up type of person. But either way, anger is not something that you should be letting control your life. Maybe you're lonely. I know right now, without even asking you to raise your hands, that there are people in this church that are lonely. And it's easy for me to say, you shouldn't be. You've got, you got a God that's with you all the time. You've got a church family. You've got, you got all this, but yet you feel alone. And sometimes the loneliest people are the ones who are around the most people because the expectation is that these people are here for me, yet they don't seem to be. Or stress. Get all stressed out. Anybody got any other things that, I mean, not physical things because they're a whole different ball game unless they're stemming from these things. Anybody else? Throw me out a couple more things that, that Christians, followers of Christ, still deal with even though they've been saved, they've been set free, they've been delivered. Doubt? Doubt? Hey, amen. Offense? Oh, that's a big one. Sierra? The need to have control. Oh, come on. I like control. No. Mike? She, she took it from you. Now you lost control. <laughs> ben? Resentment. Very closely related to bitterness, but not quite the same. Paul? Faith? Lack of? Misunderstandings? Jealousy. Oh, that green monster. Anxiety. So, see, we, we all... If we were to be honest with ourselves even, we got to realize that every single one of us deals with one of those things at time or one time or another. Is that true? So that means that all of us need the great physician. All of us need the wonderful counselor at times. And we're not wired to walk through things alone. We're wired to have a relationship with the living God and with his people. So when, when we go through those things, what should we do? Hide in our little hole and, oh, nobody mentioned depression. None of you struggle with depression? Yeah. And, and you know, the, the uh, easy pat answers are, yeah, nothing to be depressed about. Look, you've got a beautiful wife, you've got this, you've got that. It's like it's not about stuff or people, is it? It's about an inward hurt, an inward issue that needs to be dealt with. So the great physician, Jesus, the wonderful counselor, I believe, wants to touch those areas in our lives. Do you believe that? That's why he came, you know. So to get healing through the wonderful counsel, there's a few things. In Psalm 1, it says, don't sit under the counsel of the ungodly. So first off, I wouldn't go just getting counsel anywhere. I'd be very hesitant to get counseling from an unbelieving source. You can do what you want, but I'd be very hesitant to go and pay somebody $300 an hour to fix Band-Aid soul issues that they can't even really understand because they have no spiritual connection to the root causes. Now, there may be some Band-Aids that help you, but will they heal you? And my Bible says, don't sit under the counsel of the ungodly. We have a wonderful counselor. Why would we ever choose to sit under ungodly counsel? Good questions, huh? So number one, be brutally honest with the counselor. If you want to get healing, let's start with this place. Let's start with being honest. 
When you go to your physical doctor, do you say, and you, you've gone there for whatever the issue is, maybe your knee's bothering you, you get there and you say, hey, why are you here? Oh, I'm good, everything's fine. Did you really go to the doctors and tell him everything is fine? I mean, that's what we do though, isn't it? We cover everything up and say everything's fine. Inside we're hurting, inside we're bleeding, inside we're crying out. Yet we put on this face, this facade with, with people that really do love us and want to help us that everything's okay, I'm good. Now all of you don't do that. Some of you wear it right out here on your sleeve. But many of us struggle with just being honest with what's going on in our lives. And if I'm going to go to the counselor, I need to be honest with what's going on. If I got addiction struggles, let's call them what they are. They're sin issues. And I know our world right now is saying it's a disease. Whatever your addiction is, it's not a disease. It's a cursed sin issue that you need to repent from. And you can become a new person in Christ. You don't have to just, just hold on and not do that. You can be changed from the inside out. That's the power of the gospel. Imagine, isn't that amazing? Um, many people who struggle with addictions say things like, I'm an alcoholic. I haven't drank for 20 years, but I'm an alcoholic. Well, if you're a Christian and you become a new creature in Christ, my friend Ed Lawson says this, I used to be an alcoholic, but I'm a new creature in Christ. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Therefore, I'm no longer an alcoholic. Now, I'm not stupid. I don't go hang out in bars and drink. Because I know I've got this besetting sin that will tear me down and pull me back into a hole. But let's just be real. It's not an, it's not an illness. It's a sin. So let's just put it out there and say what it is. If you confess with your mouth, you've got to confess your sin. And to confess literally means to say the same thing as. So you're agreeing with God that this is sin. If you're addicted to pornography, guess what? It's sin. You can, you can blame it on all kinds of things. You can blame it on your mother. You can blame it on the internet. You can blame it on whatever you want to blame it on. But when you get to the point where you confess with your mouth, this is sin. It's lust. It's sin. It's bad for my marriage. It's bad for me. And I repent. Wow. Isn't that a lot easier than, than rationalizing it and covering it up and hiding it? And you got all this shame attached to most of our sins. Well, guess what? I hope that this is a safe place for us to just be real. I'm a sinner. I sin. I don't sin on purpose. Yet I do. Because I don't have to sin. But I still do. Yet I don't do it on purpose. It's like, wow, am I confused or what? <laughs> but the reality is that, that to get healing, to get set free from those things, you just can't keep making excuses. You got to come clean with it. You got to say, you know what? I got fear in my life that I don't understand. It controls my life. Or I've got control issues. I have to control everything because I don't trust. So let's be honest with the counselor. It's interesting because Jesus, he's, he's on a journey and he ends up in this Samaritan village. And this woman comes, the, he sends his disciples away to get some food. Now this is all planned by Jesus the master. So he's at the well in the middle of the day, and this woman shows up. Now this woman shows up and starts to get some water, and Jesus says, hey, I'm thirsty. And she's like, uh... So he had a conversation with her. And he said, I tell you the truth, if you drink of the water that I have, you'll never be thirsty again. Now just picture this whole conversation in your head. I mean, think about this. This is just weird. I love these stories that we, because that, I grew up knowing all these stories, but then when you stop and consider, what was this woman thinking? This guy's like weird. I mean, like, what's he doing here hanging out at the well in the middle of the day to start with? He, doesn't he know that that's when people like me have to come because they can't come any other time? So, and then he speaks to me and he's like, he's Jewish and I'm a Samaritan woman and I, this is just weird. And then he's talking about never be thirsty again. I want some of that water. What the heck is he smoking? I mean, seriously, I mean, if you're in, his, in her shoes, you've got to be asking those questions. So he goes on and, and tells her to go, go call your husband to come. And she's like, I don't have a husband. He says, you're right. You don't have a husband. You've had five husbands before, and the one you're with now, you're not married to. Guess what, though? She got to drink that living water. 
Because she came and she didn't hide these things. She didn't, she didn't run and hide. She didn't, she didn't say, no, 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 you don't understand. It wasn't my fault. It's those five guys that I married. There's no good men left in the world. No. She opened up her life and she got the living water. She got to know the, the Messiah. She got to know Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. And then she goes back to her village and tells everybody about him. Come and see this man that I met. Now, what would have, how would that have played out if she'd have been like, it's none of your business. And she goes trouncing off and hoping that he's gone when she comes back. Wow. But isn't that the way sometimes we approach the wonderful counselor? We want to, want to protect our own little thing and, and we don't even want to admit it. And, and then for some people, it actually becomes part of who we are. Because it's a lot safer to just know that I'm, I'm messed up and everybody knows I'm messed up. So if I just stay messed up, everything is okay. I can handle life this way. Wouldn't it be so much better to be free, to be healed? We've got to be honest with him. And, you know, sometimes that means being honest with his people as well. Now, don't go out and just share your stuff with everybody. But ask God to show you who are those people in your life that you can trust that you can pour your heart out to, that God can use, because he uses people. And then in Psalm 55, it says, Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you, for he will never let the righteous fall. What a promise. So if you cast your cares upon him, and in another place it says, Cast all your cares upon him, and he'll give you the peace that surpasses all understanding. Anybody want peace in their lives? And then First Peter, it says, give me all your worries, give all your worries and carries to God, for he cares about you. Isn't that amazing that he cares about you? The very God who said, let there be light, cares about you. And he wants you to pour your heart out to him. So that's number one. Number two, listen to the counselor's voice. Now, I think it'd be absolutely stupid to go and pay somebody, a counselor, and Share what you're going to share, and then they start talking, and you check out. Or you're like, why would I want to listen to you? And I think it's interesting, because I've done, I'm not a, I'm not, I don't think I'm a great counselor, by the way. Um, I do believe that God uses me. I have the word of wisdom as a spiritual gift that operates sometimes. It's really kind of fun. But there have been people that have come to me and come to us over the years, especially marriages, and we would, we would do our best to counsel with them, and they wouldn't listen to us, they wouldn't do anything we suggest, and then the marriage gets worse, and then they go pay somebody $300 an hour, and they do the same exact things that we've been trying to tell them for free. It's like, listen. I mean, why would you go to somebody, ask for counsel, and then not listen to what they say? Why waste your time? You'd probably be better off to read a book or something. If you're not going to listen, listen to the counselor's voice. And Jesus said of, God said of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, he said, a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. He is the wonderful counselor and he will speak words that will set you free and heal you. And it's interesting. There's something about words, isn't there? If you look through scripture, in the beginning, God said, Creation happened through words. And then in John 1, what does it say? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. See, when he speaks, there's such power when he speaks. There is such power in our words that we don't comprehend it. I'm convinced that we don't comprehend the power of our words. I, the, it, my tongue ha, is the power of life and death in it, according to the Bible. Wow. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? So listen to his words. Listen to what he's speaking to you. And maybe you say, I don't know how to hear his voice. Well, he speaks in a lot of different ways. Um, this is a pretty good way to hear his voice. Because there's some things that are pretty darn clear. Um, you know, if, if you're sleeping with somebody, having sex with somebody you're not married to, listen to his word and stop. I mean, you don't have to listen very hard to hear that one. Amen? Amen. Now, there are decisions in life, should I buy one crock pot or two, um, you know, where you might have to really kind of tune your ear and hear. And, 
My experience has been, just so you know, now, I'm not, a, I, I wished I heard more clearly. I do believe that he speaks all the time. It's a matter of whether or not my tuner is tuned in, not whether or not he's speaking. Um, but most of the time, it's not like broadcast loudly. Most of the time, it's this little whisper, Michael, do what's right. And you don't hear that if your life is so full of noise. Everything's going on. It's like you got to hear the whisper. The whisper. Listen for the whisper. Listen, listen to those things that, that really kind of... It's like... Because when you hear them, you'll be like, uh, I didn't think that. Like, for example, years ago, I was praying, I want to be a godly man. Make me into a godly man. And I heard a whisper, and the whisper said... Why? And I thought about it for months. It's like, why do I want to be a godly man? There's, what a deep question. I didn't ask myself that question. And I don't think Satan asked me that question. So why do I want to be a godly man? What's my motives? What's my heart? Why do I, do I want to just bring glory to God? Do I want people to respect me and think I'm something special? Sometimes those little whispers are the most powerful little healing tools because... That's the times when he checks your heart. There are times when he speaks louder. You know, when there's things that need to happen and you're the person, he will speak louder. But you still got to learn to hear his voice. How do you learn to hear his voice? You listen. And then when you think it's him, you're obedient. And you find out, wow, look what God did. Or like, oh, I missed it. I didn't need two crock pots after all. <laughs> but who knows? Maybe you bought two crock pots. Because sometimes... You're, you're, you're obedient, you don't even know it, so maybe somebody comes into your life that their crockpot broke, and they're like, hey, I got it covered, I got a crockpot for you. <laughs> so, who knows? Just listen, listen, listen to the counselor's voice. The first thing we got to do is be honest with him. Secondly, we got to listen to him, because he, he, are you one of his sheep? My sheep, listen to him. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Listen, listen, listen. And then do what he says. Hello, wouldn't that be a novel thing if we we're actually doers of the word? Here's a really scary thing. In James it says that those that hear only and do not do deceive themselves. Now, I don't want to be deceived. Do you want to be deceived? And the scary thing is I deceive myself. And then when I deceive myself, um, I'm a leader. And by the way, I believe that every follower of Jesus Christ is a leader. So if I'm in deception and I'm leading people, what's happening? I'm multiplying my deception. So I have to do what he says. You know, sometimes he, he says some things that just don't make sense. So here's an example. So this, this very young, rich guy comes to Jesus and he says... Um, what do I have to do to follow you? What do I have to do to be called a Christian? What do I have to do to have eternal life? And Jesus says, follow the Ten Commandments. Because we all know it's impossible. If you've, if you've kept all Ten Commandments and you're still here with us, then you're the only person ever other than Jesus. So he says, keep the commandments. And, the, and he replies, I, I've done that. Ever since I was a little kid, I've done that. And Jesus looked at him and loved him. Isn't that cool? He looked at him and loved him. He didn't look at him and say, yeah, what a, what a self-deceived person because you didn't keep them all. I can tell you because I'm God and I know, you know that, hey, um, remember that one about honoring your parents? Oh, uh, yeah. I haven't done that one, did I? I forgot that one. Oh, uh, yeah. But God, see, but God still loves us. It doesn't matter what we've done. He still loves us. So Jesus loved him. And then he says, one thing you lack. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell and he went away sad because he had great wealth. See, it wasn't the money that's the problem, it's the heart. The heart, the heart, the heart. Because the stuff was more important to him than a relationship with God. But Jesus told him, to, the, the wonderful counselor told him to do something that was absolutely crazy. Sell it. It doesn't say sell some of what you have. What's that word say? Everything. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. That makes no sense at all. 
But see, Jesus knew that this man's heart was tied up in his stuff. And the only way for him to be set free was to do a clean break. So sometimes the counselor tells you to do things that don't make any sense. I thought of one more. Anybody remember Nahum? So Nahum had leprosy. And he was sent to go visit the king of Israel because somebody said, hey, you go to Israel, you can get healed. So the king sent Nahum to the king of Israel. And he shows up and he says, hey, um, I was sent here because I heard that we heard that you can heal me. So the king is like, I can't heal you. Now I'm going to end up at war because I can't heal you. So Elisha, Elijah, Elijah says, hey, send him to me. God will heal him through me and I'll prove to you that there is a prophet in the land. So what does he do? He shows up on Elijah's doorstep and he's got leprosy and Elijah doesn't sprinkle fairy dust on him. He doesn't, he doesn't wave a magic wand. He doesn't touch him and put his hand on him. He doesn't do any of those things. He, does, he doesn't even have come forward in church and pray for him and have him fall over and flop around like a fish. He doesn't do anything like that. He tells him to go and dunk himself in the Jordan River seven times. Why? And he actually says, hey, if I was going to go just wash myself in a river, I got rivers at home. They're a lot cleaner than this river. And his, his servant actually convinced him, dude, you came all this way. Can you picture this? You came all this way. Why not just do it? And then he says, if he asked you to do something hard, you would have done it. This is easy. Just go dunk yourself seven times. So he did, and he was healed. But does it make any sense? No. It makes no sense at all. So that's, that's a good example of God telling people to do things that don't make Even when Jesus was here. And Jesus only did what the Father told him to do, right? So if a blind person came to you and, and, and you had to pray for their sight, what would you do? Wouldn't you put a little oil on their forehead and pray that God would heal their eyes and give them sight? Not Jesus. He takes some dirt and spits in it and sticks it in the dude's eye. Why? I think there's, I think there's more to it. I think, it. I think Jesus had a sense of humor. I think that he was pushing the Pharisees' buttons. I think he was saying, you think that's weird? Watch this one. Because... He need, see, Jesus is still stirring religious people up. Never stopped. So all of these weird things that the counselor might tell you to do. Here's one. How about forgive? Well, they, they did this. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what somebody did to you. The answer, the counselor is going to tell you to forgive no matter what it was. You don't understand. When I was a kid, my father used to beat me. Forgive. That's the counsel. Forgive. What do, what do you mean forgive? Just let it go. Yeah, let it go. Because vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. So they're not getting off the hook, by the way. You're not getting them off the hook. All you're saying is, I'm giving up my right to repay. God will repay. And he will repay. And here's what's really sad about it. Because there's been people that have forgiven me. And you know where that offense ended up when they forgave me? It ended up on my Lord and Savior, Jesus. And he died for it. Forgive. Forgive. It doesn't matter what the offense is. It doesn't matter what was done, what was said, what wasn't done, what promises were broken, what expectations weren't met. The answer is still the same. Forgive. And then do it again. And do it again. And do it again. Forgive. That's really weird counseling. Because in my own sense of justice, it's like, man, I ain't forgiven. I'm going to punch that guy right in the head. Forgive. Forgive. Now, I don't think any of us have mastered that one counseling bit of counsel. But we're gaining, aren't we? Are you forgiving more than you used to forgive? Bless those who persecute you. That's in here. Bless them. Isn't it bad enough I've got to forgive them? Now I've got to bless them? I don't want to bless people who persecute me. Do you? Does that sound like good counsel to you? So these, these people said bad things about you, so what you should do is pray for them and bless them and encourage them and speak well of them. I don't want to. But see, the kingdom is different than the natural world. How about turn the other cheek? I don't like that one either. Somebody hits me, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm not a fighter. I probably, I say I would probably hit them back, but probably, if truth were known, I'd run and hide. 
because I'm not a violent person, but everything in me would want to hit him back. How about you? I mean, somebody comes up and whacks you across the face. What do you want to do? Oh, try this side. You missed a spot. But that's what Jesus would say, isn't it? It's in red in my Bible. I don't like it. How about this one? Flee. See, this one I mean, I'm better at. Oh, well, not, I'm better at fleeing from fighting. But that's not what it's talking about. It says flee from youthful lust. So guess what? If, if you've got pornography issues, if you've got, if you've got eye issues, if you, if you can't go into the store without buying 20 crock pots, don't go to the store. <laughs> you know, website. You know, flee, run. That's what it literally says. Run away from those things instead of, instead of getting torn, pulled into them. I mean, if you've got struggles, sometimes the answer is to run away from them. Not always. But sometimes that's what the counselor will tell you to do. Get away from that person. Get away from those people. You want your marriage to be good? Get away from that couple. You want, you want, your, you want, you want your future, your, your career to be good? Don't hang around with a bunch of negative Nancys. Oops, oh, sorry, Nancy. <laughs> At work. I mean, if you hang around with a whole bunch of negative people, what are you going to end up doing? You're going to be negative. So if you can't change that circumstance, then stay away from that circumstance. Sometimes you have to flee. I mean, when we were working on our marriage, if it meant that we had to move out of town, out of state, we would have done it. Because our marriage was more important than any relationships we had. If that's what it takes, that's what it takes. Sometimes you just got to be obedient and trust God. And love. I mean, love is the answer to everything, right? It's really easy to love people that you like. Wouldn't it be amazing if it said, everybody that I bring into your life that you like and you get along with and everything is wonderful, love them. And then, of course, tomorrow it would be a whole bunch of different people because sooner or later I'm probably going to irritate you and you're going to irritate me. But what he says is to love, period. And so we could keep going, right? I mean, there's lots of opportunities here for us to talk about. So if you're a husband, what are you supposed to do? Love your wife sacrificially as Christ loved the church. Uh, be a leader, but serve her with everything in your life. When you want your marriage to get better, start serving your wife. Love her. Put her first. What do you mean put her first? I've been putting her first all my whole life, and she treats me like a doormat. No, love her. Put her first. Speak the truth in love, but love her. Put her first. Put her needs ahead of your own needs. And then, of course, he could say this to the, to the wives. Um, yeah, respect him. He's not worthy of respect. He's a jerk. He's a deadbeat. All he does is complain and moan, and he sits around all day and what, plays video games and, in his dirty underwear. Picture that in your mind. <laughs> kind of hard to respect that, isn't it? Well, Maybe. But it doesn't say respect him if he deserves it. It says respect him. It, says, it literally says this. This is a commandment. Wives, respect your husbands. Wow. Same with honoring your parents. Most of our parents have had issues. And if you are a parent, your kids will have to choose someday to honor you or not. And if you're a kid, someday you'll probably be a parent, so don't get too smart. <laughs> and then, of course, confess and repent. Confess and repent. Those are things that the wonderful counselor would tell us, among other things. Those things, if we could just start with those things, if we could start realizing that the first part of our healing is coming and being absolutely honest, this is who I am. Guess what? He's not surprised. If you're full of anger and bitterness, he knows already. If you're, if you're greedy or slothful or if you're, if you're jealous of everybody and everything, guess what? He already knows. So just be honest. Say, this is who I am. And then, and then listen. Listen for what he tells you. Listen for what he tells you. And then do what he tells you. What a pretty simple formula, isn't it? To bring healing into your lives. Now, I know it's pretty simplified in a three-point little message. But I promise you that if you work it, God will come into your life and bring healing. It may be instant. It may take years. But he will work it.
We're all in a process. Um, I believe that he works in, in events and he works in processes. And sometimes that event is laying in, laying on, somebody laying their hands on you and praying for you. That starts something. It's like, I don't know what happened, but something happened. And, and that starts the process of you healing. That starts the process of you walking into freedom, getting unstuck from the things that stuck you. Sometimes it's going away to a retreat or a conference or whatever it is. That event happens and boom. Sometimes it's negative events. Everything could be going along swimmingly. And next thing you know, your spouse left you and you're a disaster and you don't know what to do. But God uses that event to heal and grow you. So, Carrie, can you come on up and, and just play some chords for us? We're going we're gonna to close with a time of prayer. I have the elders and their wives come on up. and want to pray for anybody who needs prayer in this area. Um, and realizing that this may be an event that starts something happening in your life, moving you towards healing. And please, I'm, I, I don't want to manipulate anybody into doing anything. But every single one of us has probably got something that God has put his finger on today. Without exception. I believe that every person in here, God has said, that thing right there in your life is the thing that I want to touch. You may have a whole bunch of things, but the one thing that he pointed out, let's pray. And if you, want to, if you want hands laid on you, we'll pray for you. If you want to sit in your seat and pray. If you want to go and pray, whatever you want to do. But please, don't just stay without going to the counselor. Without, without moving towards healing. Because the king has need of you. And uh, one of my pet peeves, when people say the church is a hospital... The church is not a hospital. The church has a mass unit attached. And there's healing to be found in the church. But our primary motive, our primary mission is not just to heal people up for healing's sake. It's to heal them up, to send them out into the battle. To be soul winners. To be catalysts. Father God, we come to you. And we come in the name of Jesus. And we come humbly yet boldly, knowing that you are wonderful. You are too wonderful for words. There's, there's, we can't even dis begin to describe you. You're so wonderful. And you are our counselor. You are our advocate. You are, you are the, the one who can reach into our very spirit and heal us from the inside out. You are the one that can set us free forever. You're the one that can break addictions off us. You're the one that who, can, who can remove those curses off from our lives and, and change the very way we think because you are God. So God, even now, I pray that you would send your word and heal your people, each one of us, God, that whatever it is that you put, our, put your finger on, I pray for healing to come in the name of Jesus for your glory. If you want prayer.